who is the was the co-founder of the United Farm Workers of America with uh, Cesar Chavez, and has been uh, even more recently a, a peace activist, going to Washington D.C. and um, and lobbying for peace around the United States. And we have Father Lou Vitale, who we were just trying to decide whether he's actually a minister emeritus yet. Um, but he uh, seems to be in the parish more often than not these days, but is also a, a radical agitator and peace activist, and longtime peace activist, and um, has spent some time in prison for the School of the Americas Watch issue already, and may do so again in the near future. So we're looking forward to that from him. Dedicate our this night to Bill O'Donnell as the Bill O'Donnell Brigade for the Pentagon. Oh, me, and, me, you get six months in the freezer. <laughs> This is the quinceañera for the movement of, to close the school of the assassins 15 years ago. There's been 13 people then, 15,000 last year, no? Venezuela, the government of Venezuela decided not to send its troops last year and ever again to the school of the assassins. I was at the peace march in Washington, D.C., where we had uh, maybe between 150,000, they say, or 200,000 people. And um, I was thinking to myself while I was on that march and seeing how many people were on the street, we need to get these people up there to the Senate, to the U.S. Senate, right? And we need to get them over to the U.S. Congress uh, so that they can start putting uh, the pressure on our, our elected representatives because I really do feel that many of these changes that we need uh, are being, you know, the, the laws that we need, uh, like closing down the School of the Americas, uh, we need those people there in the Congress uh, to vote that down, to cut it out of the budget. They want to save some money? Let's get the School of the Americas out of the budget, right? The president said he's against terrorism. Okay, well, this gives him a chance to prove it, right? By just uh, not training any future terrorists. Uh, but uh, this is kind of my message as I go across the country to people uh, to say that they've got to get involved, they've got to get out there, they've got to register to vote. Uh, we've got to get good people like yourselves to run for office out there, you know? And, uh, and really uh, put the heat on our legislators because that's the only way well, I should say that's the only way, but that is the final way that we can make them close down the School of the Americas is by doing that lobbying, that really hard legislative work uh, to um, make sure that they close the school down. And but, but we have to let people know that, and I like to remind people that the only way that the farm workers were able to get laws like unemployment insurance, the Agricultural Labor Relations Act, a federal law in 1985 to put toilets in the field, right, was by doing the hard lobbying work, not only uh, to, you know, send people to Sacramento, people marched from 300 miles to Sacramento, but they also went to Sacramento by the hundreds with their flags and flooded, flooded the halls of the Capitol so that the, those legislators couldn't even move, they couldn't go anywhere without bumping into a group of farm workers. Uh, and uh, that's how we did it. But the other thing is that we actually supported people that ran for office. You know, going back to people like Ron Dellums right here, people like Barbara Lee, right? Uh, people like Hilda Solis, going into uh, their districts and going door to door. Uh, and you know, the people that went on knocking on those doors, uh, many of them were not um, citizens. They couldn't vote, but they could knock on a door, right? And they could go out there ahead of time and see who was registered, and then get the people that were registered out to vote. So we've got to sort of, uh, you know, put that piece into um, our action, our social action. It's got to be tied in with political action. Now, I'm probably speaking to the choir here, right? Because I'm sure that everybody here votes. Let me ask a question. How many voted in the last election? Okay, now I'm going to ask another question. How many of you went out and knocked on doors to get other people out to vote? Okay, well actually we see that our numbers drop <laughs> precipitously, right? So if everybody who <clears throat> went out to vote actually also went out there and knocked on a door or did a phone bag, then we could get out so many more hundreds, if not thousands, of people. So I think that, Father Louis, I think if, I don't know if you agree with me or not, but 
I think that we've got to add that piece onto this fight to close the School of the Americas, right? We've got to, all of us have got to organize and send hundreds of letters uh, to our Congress people to say, vote the school out of the U.S. budget. That was our first award for someone who we saw as a image of nonviolence, as a person that we knew that was a, perhaps the number one practitioner of nonviolence that we could recognize was Dolores Huerta. But I know a lot of us are quick, we're really quick in our society today with the media and all to kind of make an icon of someone and say, oh, this is a wonderful person, this is a wonderful person, this is a great outstanding inspirational person and all of that. If you just listen right there, you caught the real Dolores Huerta, whose mother was an organizer and taught her community organizing while she was raising all these children and all that in New Mexico and all that. And Dolores has always been an organizer. And Caesar also, and they started up, they had training from Saul Letsky that came to Fred Ross Sr. and so forth. And, and that is so important because we're great on getting a lot of people out. I'm a movement guy. I love movements. I love crowds. I love, you know, all of that. But after the 33 million people that turned out to stop the war, what didn't happen? You know, there really wasn't too much that happened the next day. You know, some of us were getting out of jail, and getting in jail and out of jail for a week or two, but the real organizing that needs to go on that can really make a difference. David Hart, so my good friend here, who's a great organizer, he's been doing this since he was a little kid, and dad dragged him down to Selma, whatever, down there in the south, and got arrested at the lunch counter and almost killed, and all of that. But David is always reminding us of the Nevada Desert experience. We've got to be doing the go back home. We come here to the test site, we make a big witness, we maybe get arrested, we get out, and we just go back about our jobs. But do we go visit the Congress people? Do we go make the visit? Do we organize people? Do we bring people together at the grassroots? That's of course what made the farm worker movement work, is because they do organize it, and she's still, to the very end, I mean, at this point in her life, she started a whole new organization, the Doris Huerta Foundation, to teach people how to organize. And that's what we really, really have to do. I read through some things about you here just again and again and again, but I just kept noticing how that just jumps out. And we hear it in every word you say, so I hope we can at least carry that with us. That we've got to do that kind of work. There's two, two areas of domination that are going on in the world today around the School of the Americas and the domination that it's providing the massacres that go on. By the school of the, as a result of the school of the Americas and the whole nuclear domination, which is the bottom line. Even though we own not in, in all of these almost 50 years fired another nuclear weapon, we're always reminding the world that we are ready to do it. And now our government is coming up with a new policy, preemptive, unheard of, and totally immoral. We would do, we would engage in a preemptive nuclear strike against even a non-nuclear power. If we felt they were a threat to us, well, Iraq was a threat to us, Iran was a threat to us, you know, Nicaragua was a threat to us, Cuba was a threat to us, Burger was probably a threat to them. Right now. <laughs> so, you know, we have to look at it, we have to study it, and we have to get out, and, and uh, we can get arrested at Fort Benning, but we've got to come home and really try to organize the people to say no. Because once the people withdraw their consent, Every empire falls. No empire, no government, no totalitarian government has been able to stand up when the people withdraw their consent. And that's what we have to do, but we have to make it known and felt. Not just nod our heads as we watch evening television, but get out there and say, not in our name, not in our name. We have some very powerful stories, Dolores, of uh, actually, not only of how you work, with opponent legislators, but how you work even with the legislators that are supposedly on your side. You have a wonderful story of the statue of Willie Brown when he was the Speaker of the House. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Well, you know, Caesar always used to say uh, that you could only give politicians a two-year warranty, right? <laughs> and so even if they're your friends, uh, you really have to stay on top of them. When we were trying to get the money out for the Agricultural Labor Relations Board, Willie Brown was the chairman of Ways and Means in Sacramento, 
And uh, so we were really having to put the heat on them to release that money. And he was kind of playing games with us. So when the farm workers went to Sacramento, they already had a little straw statue of Willie Brown that they were getting ready to burn. <laughs> and uh, Willie came out, you know, Willie could talk really fast and really slick, and he talked there, he says he promised everybody he would, you know, release those, that, those funds uh, for the Agricultural Labor Relations Board so they could have the elections. And so, of course, they didn't burn his statue. But the other thing, you know, Jerry Brown, uh, when he was governor of California, now he's the guy, Jerry Brown signed an employment insurance for farm workers. He signed the law for the Agricultural Labor Relations Act. But again, we were having all these problems. So we did a three day, three night sit in in Jerry Brown's office, right? Even though he was our friend. So, you know, we have to do this. Even though they're our friends, we have to uh, keep the heat on them. Uh, the other thing, too, that I think is uh, really worrisome, and we were talking about this earlier, we do have a lot of things going on right now. You know, we have the Chicano movement, we have, as we said, the peace movement, we have the environmental movement, we have the women's movement, we have the labor movement, but somehow, civil rights movement, you know, we have to get all these movements together, you know, so that we can all work together, you know. And, uh, and if this means that we have to go to their conventions and the Democratic Party, uh, and maybe even some people in the Republican Party. We have to go out there and get them to take a resolution at their, at their meetings to support this movement that we are here with tonight to close the School of the Americas, right? So we could make it a broad movement. And, you know, I would also suggest that we have demonstrations. We know Father Louis, he's not just sitting here talking about this. He's getting ready to go to the brig again. You know, he's getting ready to go to jail again, you know? Uh, because this is how much this cause means to him because he has seen the devastation that has been caused by these people who have been trained in terror by our tax dollars, you know? So I think that uh, when the caravan gets to Fort Benning, Georgia, that we should also do a demonstration here at the federal building, you know? Do one here, do one in San Francisco, you know, in all of the federal buildings that we can find you know, do a demonstration to support the caravan and the, uh, the thousands of people that are going to be there. For those of us that can't go this time, you know, then let's try to do something in our own towns with our banners there to close the school, right? But I think it's got a new name now. You know, I think they changed the name, but we've got to be there to demonstrate support and at the same time, like I said before, write letters to our Congress people and say, you know, cut this money out. You want to save money? Cut the school out. When you've come that close to actually passing a, a legislation or, or when you've actually passed legislation but the polit politicians didn't put teeth on it, is there a story or a, an experience of what you did to give that extra push in the spirit of the same basic organizing that we're talking about? Well, I mentioned uh, when Willie Brown was holding up our money in the uh, Ways and Needs Committee, and before that, Leo McCarthy, who had been the Speaker of the Assembly in Sacramento, he was doing the same thing. And so we found out that he was going to have a big fundraiser, and so we just loaded up the buses of farm workers and said, we're going to come and pick at your fundraiser, Leo McCarthy. And of course, uh, you know, every, all of the Democrats were calling, you can't do that, he's the Speaker of the House. Uh, well, we said he's got to guarantee us we're going to get our money. If not, we will pick at his fundraiser. So Phil Burton, the great Phil Burton, I think a lot of people here uh, knew Phil Burton. Phil Burton called and he said, look, he said, I've talked to Leo, you're going to get your money. Uh, please don't pick at this fundraiser. But, you know, like I said just a little while ago, that we have to put the heat on our friends, uh, sometimes as well as our enemies. And I think that we're in a really good time, don't you think, uh, so Father Lloyd, right now, uh, simply because... You know, we have a president who says he's against terrorism, right? Okay? Well, this is a good way to prove it, you know, by shutting down our own terrorist school. And I think if any time we were in a good position to raise this issue, now is a time when our president is in so much trouble because of all of the corruption and greed uh, over there in Washington. What do you think, Lou? You think it's a good time right now? Yeah, well, you know, um, again, David Hartz's friend Bill Moyers, not the one on television, but the one who teaches us about social movements, always 
says that, you know, that you have to look for the, for the right time, the dreary moment. And that most of, a lot of what we do, we say, well, nothing's happening, nothing's happening. But there's not only the organizing that goes on, but then there's something that happens in history that really, you know, gives you that opportunity. And it can be a lot of different things. Like, it can be like a, a show blowing up. It can be a meltdown at Three Mile Island. It can be, it can be a tsunami. It can be New Orleans. You know, we didn't set up the flooding of New Orleans, but it's exposed the underbelly of racism in America once again. And we look for these opportunities and they come, and then you've got to be ready to move. And one of the things that's really wonderful today is that we have whole new media channels, and that's something I see dramatically changing things. When the first Gulf War happened, I remember that nothing, well, we remember that nothing, we remember nothing because nothing happened. I mean, they started bombing and we kept saying, well, okay, you know, but nothing happened. There really weren't hardly, very little. Here in San Francisco, you know, a few places, there was a little bit of some marches, but very, very little happened. And I remember it's, uh, two or three people that I talked to, Jim Douglas and Wallace, myself, went on these kind of rather long fast. Days fast because we just didn't know anything else. There was no organizing going on. There was just kind of like Caesar, you know, you do the fast and then hope that, you know, out of that, at least spiritual power it comes that you begin to get something moving. But uh, I came out of the prison there in, in Nevada uh, just as we were, the first rallies were happening. And everywhere, when I was in Nevada at Nellis Air Force Base, the only ones that ever went there to the they have a little prison camp there. We were in the middle of the munition storage. The nuclear weapons were stored right around us, which is really against international law because you're not supposed to have civilians, which prisoners are, in the middle of weapons storages. But, but they were training all the planes that went over there to fly, the stealths and all of that that were going over there to fly, were practicing their bombing runs right there in Nevada at the Nevada test site at the Nellis Range. And we would hear that every night. And it was so depressing to lie there and hear these planes practicing. And some people are mobilizing as never before. And that's why we like having Andy Goodman, because a lot of people are following Andy Goodman, you know, and, and getting, a, you know, getting a whole new image of things. And, a, and a, uh, it, it's, it's an incredible time of mobilizing and energizing uh, and, and creativity. They allow us, like Amy took us through like New Orleans and saw the bodies lying there. And, and these events take us through it. I love going to School of the Americas. One of the things that I really most powerfully love, and I've been reflecting on my retreats and stuff about this, is that it's a time to grieve. It's a time to grieve. That I, I keep saying that Bill O'Donnell cast a spell over me, and I wasn't planning to get arrested, but when he walked by me, He's cast a spell over me. I told that to the judge, but he didn't exactly buy it. <laughs> I wanted to give more time to Bill, you know. <laughs> but, but, uh, but what it was is, is the, the procession did it. And, you know, it got me up in the grief that I had seen there. Visiting families, knowing people that, you know, knowing people that were murdered in, in, in El Salvador. But it was a chance to grieve, and out of that grief, that we go through when we go there comes this new hope. Walter Brueggemann says that, that if you don't grieve, you don't have imagination. And th there's a whole new imagination that's coming forth in the work that so many young people are doing. It's an extremely creative experience there that we'll have in the next you know, weeks. And all of these other events, the puppets, my friend David Solman and the puppets, and all of this, uh, Code Pink, you know, many groups that are that are coming out with a lot of new energy. It's very exciting. What is your thought? What's your imagination? What are you thinking about that you are going to risk arrest again, which would mean you would do a lot more time? No? Well, six months, I guess, this time, unless they figure out some other way to add on something else, which they did to the sisters. They added on sabotage. You know, they can do conspiracy, they can do sabotage. And, but my provincial conspiracy says to me, well, you're free now, and I can be the full support of the province to go out there and get arrested and, you know, do what you want. I'm just going to say one more story, and then I'm going to stop because I'm talking too much. But we had Becky Johnson come up here, and I just have to say that, uh, where's Becky? We had our child. 
Um, Becky was the one who worked us through the whole preparing for the trial and all of that. And then we went on trial and then we were getting ready to leave on a Sunday morning and she invited us to come down to the gate of Fort Benning and we were going to go have a little kind of breakfast and a little prayer or something like that. And, you know, she talked about, you know, you can shut down the Fort Benning. Well, as we walked up to the gate, we noticed something was going on there. We saw these big gates kind of moving. And when we got to the gate, those huge big gates that had been put up after 9-11, controlling Fort Benning. And remember, there's more than the School of the Americans. There's 25,000 soldiers there. There's the Ranger School. There's the Jump School. There's the General School. There's all the Special Forces Schools. There's all of this that goes on at Fort Benning. Well, Becky had closed those great big gates, took one of those, you know, like black lock things that you can't hardly cut around your pretty neck that we saw up here a few minutes ago, and locked those gates shut. And for three and a half hours, they could not open the gates to the most powerful military training school in the world. She shut it down. One person. They could have broken her neck in an instant. They could have brought out a torch and burned her back. I mean, it took a lot of guts to do that. And she just sat there smiling the whole time. I think she flipped the keys into the bushes there or something like that. Nothing violent, no yelling, no shouting, just with her own, but her own body. That's what the martyrs did. Or they remember the Jews that they went and laid down and bared their throats? You know, that's what she did. I mean, that was imaginative. It was creative. It was extremely, extremely powerful. That and the picture of Dorothy Day sitting there in Fresno with the big, you know, with the farm worker protest and the big CHP people. And those are the kind of images that always inspire me. As you know, um, I think everybody here knows that Sessa, uh, being a very strong disciple and advocate of the peace and violence, that the way he demonstrated this, I guess the most profound way, is when he went on his fast. And uh, he was afraid that the farm workers would turn to violence, because we had been on strike, I guess when he did his first fast, for three years. And uh, some of the workers were getting a little anxious and desperate. He called, I was in New York City, and he called me and he said, I'm really worried about what's going on in Delano. I remember he, he wanted me to come home immediately from New York. And I told him, no, so I said, I can't go right now. We're just, you know, we're just getting these supermarkets, these chain stores to take the grapes off of the entire chain. I said, we're going to be able to win this boycott. And no, he says, you've got to come because I'm really worried. And some of the people who were, uh, considered themselves kind of, you know, left of left, whatever, and uh, more militant, and they were starting to say, we've got to start doing something, um, you know, real, really hit these growers hard. And so what Caesar did, a very simple act, he just stopped eating. Stopped eating. And the farm workers came together, uh, they pitched tents around. He did this fast in a little gas station there at the 40 Acres, and they pitched tents, you know, to be there with Caesar day and night while he was fasting. Uh, his wife, Helen, and her daughters went to that little uh, gas station where Caesar was fasting, and they painted the windows with different colors, you know. And some of the people got offended by that. They said, well, Caesar's trying to play God. And we had religious who left because they were offended by what Caesar was doing. They felt that what he was doing was wrong. But one thing about Caesar, he had so much conviction, so much conviction. And of course, the numbers grew, the numbers grew, more people kept coming, more people kept coming. So by the time, at the end of 25 days, when Caesar ended his fast, we had thousands of people, thousands of people that were there with him to break that fast. And one of those was Robert Kennedy, who came. Robert Kennedy came and uh, broke that fast with Cesar. And of course, that dedication to nonviolence was permanent after that fast. But the other thing that he did is that we had people who were killed in the movement. We had five martyrs. And again, when someone was killed, first of all, Caesar had the fortitude that he didn't say, okay, we've got to stop, you know, we can't go on any further. But what he did, he asked everybody to fast. He asked everybody to do a three-day fast. People kept on working, you know, making arrangements for the funerals and for the marches and for the vigils, for the rosaries. But, and did, people did. And he didn't say, you have to do it. He invited people uh, to do this fast. 
which might be a good idea, Louis. Yeah, so let's for us to pass, right? It's all passed, and then and we can give them our, uh, our, 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 our meal money for that one day and contribute it to this struggle that we have to close the School of the America. As we know that um, the past have a very strong spiritual power, very strong spiritual power. And we know that it's something that you can't see, uh, but we do see the transformative power of nonviolence. And of course, this is one of the strongest spiritual offering that one does when one fasts, and it does have a lot of power. I saw it myself many times in the Farmworkers Movement. So I think it's something that maybe it's like the walls of Jericho, right? You know, we can bring them down, bring down the walls of the Office of the Americas by fasting and by doing this totally yes. with a commitment to nonviolence, to Pache Bene. I found it very, very powerful, I know for myself. And one thing, by the way, that's interesting, yesterday was the end of Ramadan, the Muslim fast, and they have found this as a renewal. Uh, Ramadan has become much more popular than it had in many years, and a number of us now are doing it. I even did it in prison. Uh, and just finished it now, but doing it with the Muslims just to show that we're not out about killing each other. You know, we're about, we're really about a really spiritual transformation that needs to happen. With the great boycott in, in 65, you all developed a, a, city, a series of committees and groups that went around the, the country, you know, setting up and organizing small teams. And I'm wondering, that could be an idea to give folks here uh, ourselves as we're working to close the School of Assassins. These are mostly farm workers, and uh, since they were putting everybody in jail in Delano, and even though the strike was very successful, we were able to get people to come out and join the strike as they brought in more and more strike bakers. So we sent the farm workers out, we sent them out to the cities uh, to ask people to boycott grapes, and they set up support committees, like we'd send a person to Boston. Uh, by the way, the person that went to Boston was totally illiterate. He was a farm worker who could not read or write, and we sent him to Boston. <laughs> Can you imagine? And lo and behold, this farm worker who was illiterate, and, oh, but he also couldn't speak English, okay? Besides being illiterate, he was the first one to clean the city of Boston with grapes. This one illiterate farm worker. You know? story about him. He, he told me the story. Uh, there used to have the Boston Common where people would come together during the Vietnam War. And so he wanted to make sure that they knew about the boycott. So he made, he made a bunch of boycott grape signs and he put them on poles. And so then he would go up to a person and say, could you hold my pole here because I've got to go to the bathroom, right? <laughs> And then he would go up to another person and say, could you hold my pole here? I've got to get something out of my car. So pretty soon the whole Boston Commons was full of boycott grave signs, right? And uh, he was extremely mad imaginative. One of the people that was working with him told me, told him that, told me they, were, they were traveling together and there was a fire. So he pulled the car over to the side and said, what are you doing? He says, get the leaflets, get the leaflets. We've got to leaflet the people here at the fire, right? <laughs> And it was just, you know, by, you know, passing, uh, you know, thousands of leaflets, thousands of leaflets standing on the street corners with big signs that said, boycott grapes, right? Uh, that, you know, so many thousands of people, uh, just going to churches, going to places and talking talk to people, that's what was done, and setting up these committees. So we've been talking about maybe we can do this, setting up committees all over uh, the United States uh, so that we can really tie this down and go from the 131 votes, I mean, 131 sponsors that we have now in the Congress and get over uh, so we can get the majority of the people in the Congress to come on our side and to close that school. Yes. I think that kind of control we've been seeing of the Congress that's been going on is drastically weakening and uh, this could really be the moment to close the School of the Americas. So let's really take that as seriously as we can and go out here determined to do what we can to organize to for once all close School of the Americas, Wimsick, whatever the hell it's The School of the Assassins needs to end now. Get me with the peacemakers!